I was looking to uh, expand the boundaries of the education and the music scene that surrounded me, and I made the right choice. Hello and welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we are talking today with a bassist that has a fascinating background as a composer, as a performer. He's moved all over the world, as you're going to hear about today. We are chatting today with Yuri Galkin, who just put out an album titled For Its Beauty Alone, and it has been turning heads, getting great reviews and all about jazz, jazz weekly, and all sorts of other places. He's got a show coming up, an album release at Smalls in New York City on February 19th. We talk about the album, we talk about how he got into composing, also workflows, which I always love chatting about, orchestration, how people compare him to Gil Evans, much more. I know you're going to love today's conversation. And I want to give a shout out to our sponsors, to Dario Strings, Steve Swan, String Bass, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Modacity. Colstein Music and the A440 Violin Shop. More on them later. And you're also going to hear a uh, little music at the beginning and the end here from this latest album by Yuri. So enjoy that and let's dig into the show. are you from are you from moscow or the moscow area or yeah moscow area okay. yeah pretty much i grew up in a small town uh in the moscow region and um you know uh pursued my education in moscow and developed on the scene there and um yeah that's how it worked I yeah. was I was in Russia in 1997, which was an interesting time to be. I I did the Amer <laughs> American Russian Youth Orchestra was called. It doesn't exist anymore. It used to be called the American Soviet Youth Orchestra. You know, the, uh, back in the wow. <laughs> back in the eighties, and we did. We started by touring the United States. We played Carnegie Hall. We played Tanglewood. We played a bunch of places, and then we went and we spent like. I don't know, like five or six weeks in Russia. And so we went to St. Petersburg. We went to Moscow. Then we did, uh, we went to Yekaterinburg, where the, right, yeah. in the Ural Mountains. And we did a Volga boat tour. So we, we all, this orchestra loaded up on a riverboat and went down the Volga and hit up like four cities on the Volga. And that was a, that was a fascinating trip. Um, and played in a lot of the concert halls. And uh, it was nice. just, yeah, it was really interesting. Um, and that was a while ago. I was thinking about that because I knew we were chatting today. I was thinking, man, I mean, 97, what's that, 23 years ago? Um, uh -huh. It's been some time. <laughs> and, and you were born early nineties. Is that? Or... Yeah, I was. Yeah, nineteen eighty two. Okay. Super size. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so how is, how is that? And they, these, these conversations have no structure, by the way, it's just like, we talk about whatever, and obviously we'll talk about, your right. but I'm just, I'm just curious, um, like what, since I was there in 97, how, how have things changed like for musicians or, um, like, like, like how was your experience just over those years in Russia, maybe as a, as a bass player or a jazz musician or anything? Sure. Um, yeah, to start with, uh, well, my parents didn't want me to become a musician in the first place, although they were musicians, they are still musicians themselves, and uh, I graduated from, um, I have a master's degree in aeronautical engineering, so that's what I was doing, and um, uh, I didn't start, well, I was always been doing music, and uh, um, I was classically trained since I was six or seven uh, as a classical pianist, by the way. But I didn't start my formal professional education in music until 2003, although I played with different bands before that, and I was, in fact, a self-taught musician. Um, so I enrolled into the uh, Gnesin Academy in 2003. Um, before that, I was freelancing and pursuing my uh, engineering. 
Masters. Um, well, I should say um, the reason my parents didn't want me to become a musician, a musician was that um, uh, 1990s was a complete disaster for the <laughs> for the for the country in general, and probably musicians, teachers, and uh, all these related occupations took, you know, the hardest toll. Um, it was hard to get a job or get a gig or just to get, it was hard to get paid. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it changed, gradually it changed, I should say. So in 2000, and there was a jazz scene development, there was a jazz scene developing Okay. Okay. Yeah. So did that so, that started to develop kind of like as we got into the two thousands? That became more of a scene, more of a vibrant scene, maybe, or more. Gigs? It started. It started to develop um, a lot uh, as soon as nineteen nineties arrived, mm. and uh, uh, probably and people could uh, go abroad, you know, and study there. And musicians from the United States could come over and play and share their experiences and all that. Because before that, before 1990s, during the Soviet era, it was very difficult to uh, to get out of the country. Um, um, so as a matter of fact, if you want to <laughs> leave the country, you wouldn't be able to come back. So there's many people just uh, immigrated to, uh, you know, United States, Israel or Europe and stayed there and never came back. Um, and it was difficult, on the other hand, for uh, American and European musicians to come over because they had to um, make a special permission, um, you know, because everything was controlled. And it was even harder in uh, for, for jazz musicians because jazz music wasn't favored really by the authorities back in the day. For It was... Uh, um, a little bit easier for classical musicians because classical music is kind of, you know, is, is different, but, um, you know, it was all ideology. Um, so as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, it became much easier to get all this information and uh, even get all these records. So the, to get a record was difficult. You couldn't get in a record store or hear this music on the TV on the radio, anywhere, it, it wasn't available. Uh, the only way you could get it is just to, uh, you know, copy those tapes from from uh, one of those, you know, not so many people. Yeah, right. <laughs> had them. yeah, it was very difficult, very difficult. So we 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 didn't know, we didn't hear much jazz. We didn't, you know, we didn't really have any access to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah. Wow. So, and it all changed uh, as soon as, you know, the evil empire collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that makes it, yeah, it makes so much sense because if, if you can't get those albums, I mean, that's a, the musical tradition passed down from, you know, D D Duke Ellington and before him through Charlie Parker and Coltrane and Miles and you name it. And like, if you don't have, if it's so challenging to get those albums, it makes sense that the jazz scene would start to take off once the access to that music was easier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was so, I should say, it was so rare to study abroad to, uh, to get an education in, in jazz or, well, in, in any area. Um, I think in 1990s were like only a handful of people who went abroad and uh, got a degree and all that. But now there are so many Russian musicians of all sorts studying in America, in Europe, and all over the place. And it's, you know, it's not... <laughs> it's more, much it's not, more common, yeah. Yeah, it's not exotic anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when, when you when you ended up going to school in two thousand three, were were you studying uh, for music? Were you studying jazz, or were you studying music in general? Or yeah, I was enrolled enroll into the jazz course. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, it was it was a jazz course. Um, 
and it I think it developed very much since then. But um, yeah, I had a I had a, actually a great teacher who uh, who is no longer with us anymore, unfortunately. But um, he he knew how to tell tell us one or two things without you know getting on our way. Sure, sure. And, uh, with me, he let me, you know, develop my own thing. And I was, um, early on, just as soon as I started, I was, unlike probably many others, I was into developing my own thing and uh, into following my own path in, 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 every, in every respect. And I was lucky to have um, this teacher, so he understood and he didn't, you know, pressure me into, you know, doing certain things, you know, because some teachers, they they want you to do certain things, and, uh, yeah, you end up, <laughs> yeah, joining the tribe and being like everyone else, and all of a sudden it stops being interesting, yeah, and so on and so forth, yeah. Well, so, so and you had, or we're getting, or you have your master's in, is it aeronautical engineering? It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I love, uh, and I know several musicians who have an engineering background and then music as well. Uh, are there, uh, do you find any, I know in a lot of ways it's a totally different thing, but are there any like ways of thinking that you find similar? Like if you, I mean, this is going back a few years at this point, but like, are there any things you find in common with the, the mindset of an engineer or the mindset of a musician or maybe of a jazz musician? I think so. It's hard to tell because I didn't know myself otherwise. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so sure. I can't really step aside and, uh, you know, compare two different myself. And, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, but, but my feeling is um, I was always good at math, uh, even at school, even before I started um, uh, my engineering thing. Um, and I think that enabled me to dig deeper into composition. Moreover, my um, classical piano background enabled me to know the piano more and use it in certain ways and imagine the sound on the piano and to know the, you know, harmony better and to... Uh, just see these, well, I should say formulas and uh, structures and all that kind of stuff. And um, probably piano and um, my math brain, whatever. For sure. <laughs> the definition <laughs> is um, enable me to go to the uh, to, to become a composer and uh, a creative one, I suppose. And uh, uh, well, not not an ordinary one, I should say. So I was always looking for certain you know neat solutions when I was composing or arranging, orchestrating, whatever. Um, and finally, you know, lately. Well, past few years, I was fascinated by 12-tone composing, 12-tone approach, and uh, yeah, it, it just makes me happy. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Did you know that you can tell the difference between D'Addario Strings by the silking? Peg and silking denotes pitch and tension. So E is green, A is black, D is yellow, and G is red. C, by the way, is purple if you have a C string. A thin band of yellow just before the metal winding denotes light tension. And a thin orange band of silking denotes heavy tension. Ball and silking, that's the stuff down by the tailpiece, denotes string family like Kaplan, Helicor, or Zyax. Learn more at orchestral.diderio.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. As I think 
over the years, how many times I've used Colstein products. It's just amazing. I look at my base right now, which has on the same bib that I bought while in high school. That's a Colstein's bib. I can't believe that this thing is still kicking, but I have my pencils and my rosin and all those other accessories in my bib. And when I look inside my bib, I see my Colstein rosin, which Peter Lloyd and so many other bass players use. I enjoy their ultra rosin. And I have my Colstein instrument cleaner that I've used for years and years to keep my bass looking good and clean. They've got Veracore strings, which Michael Klinghoffer loves to use, especially on student basses. They've got quivers, stands, so much more. Learn more about their accessories, their beautiful pedigree instruments, and so much more at Colstein.com. My daily companion for practicing is the app Modacity. I love it so much. And the interface is so simple. You open it up and you see a microphone and a timer. And here is Modacity founder Mark Gelfo on why you see that in the interface. It comes down to practice efficiency. And practice efficiency, the way that I think about it, is an equation with three different variables. One of them is learning milestones. One of them is retention. And the other is time. I define practice efficiency as learning milestones times retention divided by time spent. Modacity has helped my practicing so much and so many other people I know. You can learn more at modacity.co and visit our site for a special offer on lifetime access to this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. <laughs> well, the, the, I, I love your musical language. I've listened through to the, the most recent album, and it's or, or the, the, your this is your debut album, actually, right? This is your f- no, this is the second album. Oh, it's the second album. Okay, but the one that just came out uh, for its beauty alone, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I love the language. I, I just love the colors that you explore, and I've been checking out some other things that I found on YouTube and listening to some other interviews you've done, and it's it's really interesting. Uh, and uh, so. And I love talking to people who uh, who create and compose, and and so I'm guess I just love to know a little bit about your process. Um, do you? I'm guessing with your piano background, do you do a lot of your composition at the piano, or pretty much all of it? All, yes. Okay. Do you ever yeah. do any of it at the bass, or is it almost all almost yeah, all? Yeah, I do sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, I do it on the bass, and there are certain. Um, when it concerns certain grooves and, uh, or sometimes just a groove came to my mind and, uh, you know, I pick it up on the bass and make something out of it. And then I add on later on, but yeah, probably 90% of my time of my composing time. I use, I use the piano because I, um, other thing is I don't like sticking with, uh, you know, already established approaches. I like to explore and, uh, you know, going to, uh, you know, get creative and adventurous. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so, it's, so, um, when you get a groove going, you get an idea going, if it's the piano or usually the piano or maybe the bass, sometimes do you, do you then write it down or do you record it or do you just keep it in your mind? Like what, like, like an idea comes to you and then like, how does that, what's the next step for you? Uh, I write it down. Okay. Yeah, cool. I write it down mostly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, like for for the and I and I, like create creativity is it is you can kind of sit down and make yourself do it, but it's also like a, kind of a chaotic thing too. It like comes to you when you but like do you um do you try to compose every day? Do you compose when you're inspired? Do you sit down at the piano at 10 a.m. and say I'm going to work for an hour or like how or all of the above? Like how do you how do you all schedule? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all of the all of the above and in different phases of. You know, life in general, it yeah. works one way or the other. But, you know, sometimes it's a discipline. You have to, you know, sit yourself and, you know, make something out of that time. Sometimes, you know, it's just an idea comes to your mind and, you know, creativity sparks and you go along with it. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, well, if you listen to uh, that, my last album, uh, you might have gotten a feeling that it it sounds actually like uh, not like not like individual tracks, but more like a suite. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, and uh, so lately, I realized, and I very much like this idea of um, 
sort of writing, composing a few pieces simultaneously. So like, yeah, it, it's been, because, and the advantage of it is uh, that I don't get tired of doing the same thing, um, you know, for a long period of time. And at the same time, the atmosphere, the vibe, evolves between the pieces you know travels and creates a feeling that it, they're not just you know uh separate tracks or separate compositions but a part of the uh part of the bigger um a bigger uh scheme uh, i presume that's how classical composers you know made all these symphonies and uh you know that 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 doesn't different movements doesn't sound like different pieces. Yeah, and some of my favorite jazz albums, if I think about, it, have that connection too. I mean, even like like certainly like uh, Duke Ellington, I think the Far East Suite or a lot of his yeah. albums like have that connection. Certainly uh, the sketches of Spain. When I definitely hear some Gil Evans and some of what has he is he an influence on you or? Uh... <laughs> you know what. Um... Many people told me that, uh -huh. but I was never, well, of course I admire him. I know who he is, but I was never an avid listener yeah. of, of his. So I guess it came naturally somehow. I mean, <laughs> there is some sort of existing connection or I don't know. Isn't that know. interesting? It's interesting, though. Yeah. Like, well, maybe you listen to maybe some of your influences were the same influences of Gills, too. And and maybe sure. like yeah. you arrive like who are um, uh, some other they don't have to be certainly don't have to be bass players. But if you had if you had to pick only five Desert Island recordings that you that like like who are some of your favorite arrangers or composers or what are the, what are like what are some of those uh, people that you found most inspiring? Oh, I can't do five. I know it's hard. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you can expand it out, but <laughs> but first two will be uh, two records of mine. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Just yeah. So we got three left, right? Now we got three left, exactly. <laughs> okay, and three my future records. There we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> no, but if if seriously, uh, you know, I was drawn to different uh, different records in different genres across the genres in different times and mm -hmm. different phases of my life. And um, at certain times I was, you know, listening to Mingus. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and um, uh, I've been listening a lot to uh, David Binney, mm -hmm. saxophone player on my latest record. Yeah. And he, uh, I think influenced me a lot you know just I, I try not to limit myself and even not necessarily jazz but I was also influenced by rock music like when I was a kid I was listening to Beatles mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. some Pink Floyd mm -hmm. and uh, King Crimson yeah and a lot of classical music as you imagine, so that would be, well, Stravinsky, uh, all these Russian... Oh, fantastic. Yeah, you name them. Yeah, yeah. Prokofiev, yeah, right, Rachmaninoff, right, right. Shostakovich. It's... <laughs> yeah, Shostakovich, Stravinsky, Tchaikovsky, yeah. and uh, uh, 20th century composers like uh, Elliot Carter. Uh, yeah, just... That's cool, yeah. Elliot Carter too. Yeah, I yeah. fascinating, fascinating. Uh, you know, musical language and and textures and, um, I I it's something I'm I'm not I I do a little bit of arranging, very, very amateur. You know, I'm not really, but I'm always fascinated by by people who have a talent for orchestration. And, and finding those voices. And I, I just had on the podcast maybe four or five months ago somebody who was a bass player in Los Angeles. Well, he still plays some bass in Los Angeles for film scores, but he moved into the, the orchestration world. And, and I just think it's so interesting. Like, how do you think about orchestrating a piece? Like, do you, like you're writing at the piano, mostly, maybe a little bass or other ways, but how, do you, how, how does that turn into a piece for multiple instruments? Like, how, how does that process? 
process work for you? Uh, you know, I think I imagine imagine the palette of uh, instruments, and uh, um, again, I try to uh, approach this process creatively and uh, trying different colors and textures. Um, and I think I, you have to hear certain uh, certain sound sounds in your in your head, you know, when you do that, and uh, or sometimes you come up with uh, with with these sounds before the uh, you know the structure created. So you think like, all right, okay, saxophone is playing this, or two trumpets, or you know, we're not playing that or I want this particular sound or that and then you come up with a uh, with the textures based on these ideas and uh, yeah but I think the um, the foundation of it all is just uh, um, knowing the piano and knowing how to place the voices where you can do what the possibilities are. Um, because I think, again, because of my uh, classical pianist background, it came to me so naturally. So um, <clears throat> even though when I, when I started my formal education as a musician, I was so much ahead of, of my peers you know, when I just started writing the, because we had assignments to write an arrangement for on for, for the piano mostly, so like four voices, five voices, voices, or the whole you know piano arrangement that could be then probably uh, transformed into the orchestration, right? Yeah, and um, uh, I think. Well, I know that I was much better than anyone else, right? Right from the start, because um, I could just see and hear those, uh, you know, voicings, and make the uh, nice choices and well, right choices. Well, there is no right or wrong, but but I would say reasonable, you know, whatever whatever you call them and more sophisticated and um, you know right from the start I think I realized I was into it so I didn't kind of have to um, uh, push myself into developing this much I just started and went along with the process and it, called, it all came naturally this episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And you know, there's a lot that goes into being a bass player beyond that initial purchase of a bass. We need bass bows, we need bass covers, we need stands, we need new strings, pickups, wheels, quivers, upgraded gear like tuning machines, end pins, repair parts, all of that. And when someone's looking for some new bass gear or to upgrade something on their bass, I send them to Steve's shop. He's located just south of San Francisco in the Bay Area, and he is the largest dealer in basses between Los Angeles and Canada. That is a big distance, folks. Learn more at steveswanstringbass.com. And thank you so much, Steve, for sponsoring the podcast. When I was recently chatting with Gary and Eric of Upton Bass, I asked them, how did they do what they do? How do they build their presence and be so top of mind among bassists around the world? Here's what they said. My ego doesn't want to say this, right? And Eric's won't like it either. But because of the timing we couldn't do again what we've done. Yeah. And what they have done is absolutely extraordinary from their beginnings as an accessories shop online to now making over 120 bases a year. They're coming up as I record this on 1700 bases. They've got an army of satisfied customers who bought multiple bases. They're just really doing great things. They do great work and stand behind their products. Check them out at uptonbase.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast guys. 
going in and doing this early 2000s and then I, I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but did you move to the United Kingdom for a few years too? Yeah. Sh- yeah. yeah. Um, when, did, when did that happen? And how long were you there? Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's interesting because I didn't stay long uh, at this academy in Moscow uh, because in 2005 I moved to, uh, I moved to the United Kingdom to London to study the Royal Academy of Music. Um, I went for the audition like six months before that or something like that. And uh, I was awarded a full scholarship and I moved to pursue my postgraduate course there. And since uh, uh, started from 2005 till 2012, I was in, I was in London. Wow. Yeah. That's a good chunk of time. What what was the experience yeah. like moving? I still I'm going to the UK for the first time in three weeks, but not London. I still got to get to London. Never been to London. I can't believe I haven't been there. But what was the experience uh, like going? Had you been there before? Or was that your first time in the UK? Yeah, it was my first time. OK, yeah. so what was that experience like uh, going, auditioning at the Royal Academy, then moving to London and then living there for quite a few years? What What was that like? Well, it was it was Fun. Um, <laughs> <I'll bet. Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what else would you expect? Right, I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the reason I moved that uh, was that um, I was looking to uh, expand the boundaries of the education and the music scene that surrounded me, and I made the right choice, I should say, because. Um, at that time, and I think still at present day, uh, jazz scene of London is much better developed than uh, the jazz scene in Moscow. And the uh, um, the course at the academy was much more interesting and engaging. And um, I got into the right environment of uh, developing myself again as a composer and a uh, um, musician first, yes, but then composer and arranger because we had these great uh, uh, composition and arranging workshops with Pete Churchill there. And we composed and played our pieces with, with the academy, you know, students. Mm. So that, that part... Uh, wasn't and still isn't happening really in Moscow. Yeah, you don't get to do that. Um, and uh, also, the London scene was very much more diverse. So, if you go and play gigs or you listen to other people, the music is much more diverse. And um, yeah, it's it's just way way healthier i would say and um um uh, that provoked me to uh oh, provoke but yeah i created there my uh nine piece orchestra cool so it was yeah right arrangements so my first album was uh uh with a no net um Nine horns and the rhythm section, so it's piano, bass, drums, and two trumpets, trombone, and three saxophones, alto, tenor, and baritone saxophone. And baritone saxophone was also doubling on uh, bass, clarinet, and soprano saxophone. So it was a pretty engaging experience. And I recorded my first album with this, with this band, and we toured the country. Yeah. That was that was very interesting. Yeah, well, I could see. You know, it's funny because the the instrument instrumentation is different than the those famous Miles. You know, the 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 Gil Evans, but the the nonet. I think wasn't that a nonet too? That might be part of why people s- say that they re- that Gil Evan they see some parallels yeah. in your music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, well, how about the parallel? I think with Gil Evans that I also like this. Uh, yeah, I would say that that's just an approximation, but um, like uh, sound of fourths, yeah. you know, all yeah, these yeah. things, you know, happening, mm-hmm. not just um, traditional approach, but more more of that 
particular yeah. colors. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> well, yeah. what a cool scene. I can't wait to finally get to London and check it out. And then and then back back to Moscow for a few years uh, yeah. for you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I went to we were well we me and my family mm-hmm. went to went back to moscow in 2012 well as a matter of fact because we were in a way forced to um uh, because english authorities refused to extend my artist visa there you know yeah. after after the you know considering the fact that i toured the country and i had a grant from arts council england to you know to support the tour they still didn't see enough of me Ugh. for yeah yeah unbelievable frustrating yeah yeah after seven years of uh uh providing basically jobs for mm-hmm. you know other musicians and uh you know, creating my own gig, my own projects, recording this album and uh, touring with that. They they made this crazy decision, so we had we had to go back. But um, yeah. <laughs> well, but now you've got a new chapter. Now you've been out in in the New York City area for a few years now at this point, right? Three years. Three years. Okay. So, yeah. uh, and let's you know, if I think of jazz, New York City is the probably the first place that comes to mind, right? I mean, there are lots of good. I live in San Francisco. We've got a good jazz scene here, but it, there's nothing like New York that that I've seen at least. So, um, what if you're as a jazz musician, what a natural place to um, to want as a destination. So did you, um, had you been planning to move to New York city for years? What was it like kind of getting ready to make that move? How was, what was the experience like moving to a a jazz hub like New York city? Like what's, what's that whole process been like for you? Yeah. I've been wanting to move here for, uh, quite a few years Yeah, and it's been a long process with all this immigration and stuff. But finally we made it, uh, it was a very long-term goal with, you know... <laughs> I'm sure. All, I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if you, if you really want it, you can, you can do it. Yep. Um, and yeah, you're right. I think uh, that New York City is probably one of the best places in the world if you're a jazz musician. And um, most importantly is that... Um, uh, what I like about it is that you can find your crowd here. So there's so many, um, so much of different music played around. Yeah. And uh, you can introduce yourself to, well, engage yourself with playing with different different people and find your crowd and uh, like-minded people. You don't have to necessarily, you know, join a certain tribe yeah. of musician mm-hmm. uh, and uh, just adjust your, you know, preferences and whatnot. But no, you can, you can do what you like and you can find people, you know, to make it with. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, can... and, and people on the highest level. Oh yeah, it's it's incredible. Yeah, like where else? I've never been anywhere where you can walk in and see the caliber of musicians in a cl- you know all these famous musicians. They're, they're like playing jazz dates in New York City, and and I was I was in New York uh, about. 14 months ago, Rufus Reed was playing, you know, yeah. Friday night and every, I mean, it's just, it's just such a phenomenal, the, the, the scale of activity and the diversity of activity, like you're saying, the diversity of groups and, and, and if yeah. you, if you want it, it's, it's there. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's very, congratulations on, uh, on getting all those pieces. That's not easy. I, I, I would, I would, I would be terrified to move to New York city and I like live in the States already you know but like to to the challenge i can't even imagine all the challenges but it's very cool and then so this album you recorded then he, uh in in new york the city or new york city area the, the uh for its beauty alone that was recorded yeah it, yeah. yeah cool it actually happened in the 
uh, in this famous uh, recording studio that is uh, now, that closed down, um, Systems Two. Okay. Yeah, ever, ever heard of that? <gasps> uh, yeah, um, that rings a bell. I, 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 I Brooklyn, yeah, yeah. I, I think literally thousands of records of very well-known, famous jazz musicians were made there. Yeah. And uh, it's a great place, and I was fortunate to make this album pretty much a few months before it's closing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was made here in New York City. And how long, lo- how, what was the recording process like? Did you record over a, a period of several days? Did you re- rehearse with the, with uh, David and Matt and the folks that, that you recorded with and then come in or did you improvise a lot? Like just what was the whole actual creation of the album process like? I we had a rehearsal, just one. <laughs> oh, okay, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, two days of recording. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Okay. But that's, that's basically all. Yeah. It's great. Well, uh, when you're working with players like that, that's all you need sometimes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Um, and uh, you don't want to fall into the uh, over rehearsing. Yeah. Thing. When it loses freshness. And it's important to have people on the record um, who are, you know, who can kick in right away with mm-hmm. the music, mm-hmm. who can get the music and take it on a different level right away. For sure. Yeah. You got to watch out for that, right? Because you want to, you, you, there's, you, you don't want zero preparation typically, but yeah, you don't want to overcook it too. There's like yeah. a, ma- a magic point. And when you're trying to get it on the record, that's a, that can be a tricky thing to do, but it sounds like it worked great for this one. And I, I'm oh, sure you've got, I, I can't wait. <laughs> I, I have, I've had people on the podcast five, I even have somebody who's been on, I think seven times at this point. So I know, I know you've got another album in you. So, so we got to add to those top five desert Island albums. We got your first album your second album <laughs> no that was a joke <laughs> i know i know but but yet still we got uh, i i'd love to hear do you have uh thoughts about what uh, i mean this just came out so so but do you have yeah. anything uh in mind for a project maybe 2020 2021 uh any albums or projects like that in the works uh yeah well um i'm always into the uh into this creative mode mm-hmm. and uh, for future projects uh, well, my next project would probably use again some or maybe more electronics cool okay yeah maybe uh, you know a little bit more of these textures and uh, nice uh, yeah like um spaces and uh i don't know how to how to explain it but um yeah well i like to get deeper and i i don't uh what i can say is that i don't want i don't want to release the same record twice yeah right (laughs) right for sure for sure and it seems like you haven't so far um uh i've got to check out i've just checked out this first record i'm going to go back or this most recent record i want to go back and check out that nonet record and um yeah, it's it's really interesting what you're doing. Uh, congratulations on all the accolades for the album. You've gotten some great press for it, um, Thank you. and well yeah, deserved. It's been and well, so far, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you find if you find yourself uh, out here in the San Francisco Bay Area at some point, let me know. I'd love to come check out uh, if you if you're playing out here. Come check it out or uh, meet up and hang out, and it'd be great. Sure, to... I absolutely will do, Jason. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great, and yeah. Uh, Anything else you want to get out there to the to the folks for the podcast, or I'll link up to everything that we talked about and the album certainly. Um, but anything yeah, else? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that we have an official album release show at Smalls Jazz Club. Right in February, right? Yeah, it's on February nineteenth, uh, seven thirty and nine p.m. sets. And it's Smalls Jazz Club in Greenwich Village. I think it's 183 West 10th Street. And it'd be a, with a slightly different, well, <laughs> with a totally different lineup. Um, myself, uh, Alex Loray on alto saxophone, Lex Corton on the piano, and uh, wonderful 
Vinny Esperazzo on drums. So please come come to hear us on uh, February 19th, 7.30 and 9 p.m. Smalls Jazz Club in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good show. <laughs> Folks, check it out. And uh, yeah, congratulations once again. And uh, let's uh, let's do this again soon. Thanks for chatting, Yuri. Very cool album. Love it. And folks, check out the show notes for links to this album and everything that we talked about here. And also, you can follow along with Yuri on Instagram. And be sure to check out that album release if you are in New York City or can make it to New York City on February 19th. That's very cool cool. Thank you so much for listening. I totally appreciate it. Maybe it's your first episode. Maybe it's your whatever, whatever we're on here, 650-ish or something like that. Regardless, I really appreciate you being on this crazy journey with me and with everybody else who listens to the show. I'm just always amazed when I find out where people are from, how they discover the show, wh- the circumstances in which they listen to it, which is always fascinating to me. And it just makes me remember that I'm not just sitting here in my San Francisco go dwelling, talking to a microphone like a lunatic by myself. Well, actually, that's exactly what I'm doing right now, but it goes out to the world and I just, it's still, I've been doing it 13 years here and it's just still remarkable to me. So thank you for listening. If you want to get in touch and suggest a guest, uh, keep track of all that, by the way. Uh, sometimes it takes years to get to the suge- suggestions, but um, I'd love to hear from you. Feedback at ContraBasedConversations.com is the email. And even if you don't have a guest suggestion, you just want to say hi, I'd love to hear that as well. Contrabass Conversations is not just me, thankfully. It is produced by a great group of folks. They are Michael Cooper and Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, Trevor Jones, and Krista Copper. And by the way, if you're looking for a cool podcast, Krista makes a great one. It's called The Backstage Creative. And if you're looking for a double bass or some double double blah, 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 double bass work, <laughs> can I say that? In the Dallas Fort Worth area, Mitch Mooring is making beautiful basses. He's winning awards for his basses. And he's just a he's just an outstanding human being, too. So thank you to Mitch. Thank you to the whole team. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Uh-huh.